at a pub. They ask themselves hard questions. Why is it that education is so hard to change? Why is it that the ideas spoken in educational events seem to be simply echoes of what is said in class? These students decided to shake things up a little bit. And they came up with a different way of coming up with better solutions. So back in 2018, they created burning questions confronting our educational assumptions. And in that year, they laid the concrete and foundations, which we now know as our principles. The first one being active participation. We really believe that all of the activities here at Burning Questions, we try to add an element of it being hands-on and, uh, and for the second principle, we have meeting new people, making connections and strengthening existing ones from people all across the world. And lastly, we have dialogic discourse being our final principle. And what dialogic discourse means is to have a conversation where social and professional status are on equal playing fields, creating an opportunity for openness, critique, and creative thoughts. And so in 2018, they brought their questions to their dialogue circles with questions such as, what makes educational space effective? And how does lifelong learning impact universities? They also had panelists such as Anita Rampal and Posse Salberg. And they even had what is described as multi-sensory activities designed to pull people out of their learning comfort zone. Last year, they had the theme of decoloniality, exploring how colonialism continues to echo in today's society, especially in the construction of knowledge. That was actually the first year I attended Burning Questions, and this is when I became very interested in the event. And I had the great opportunity to attend wonderful workshops such as educational export and spaces and places of learning. This year, we are continuing the Burning Questions story with the theme of accessibility, building education towards a sustainable world. Accessibility is a multi-level topic encompassing socioeconomics, institutions, representation, and individuality, with issues including knowledge capital, inclusivity, sustainability, and physical access. This year's theme came out of one of the most difficult in the educational world, with the pandemic changing how we fundamentally experience learning. But when we were developing this year's concept many months ago, we found it to be the perfect opportunity to tackle one of the broadest and most important topics within education. Today, we attempt to write a new story, one that branches away from our normal storyline and towards building a more sustainable and accessible future. But before we embark on this experience, it is important to know the characters of our story, which is all of you lovely people. Following our first, our first principle, burning questions in an event where we try to make it as hands-on as possible. And following the second principle, we try to make sure that we people create new connections and build new ones with people from all across the world. In a moment, we will break you up into multiple breakout rooms with a set of questions for all of you to start to become acquainted with your fellow participants. These questions are simple and cozy, meant to break the ice between yourself and other participants. You will be in those breakout rooms for five minutes, and then we'll return back to the main session where we will have maybe one or two of you share your thoughts. Then we'll have a second set of questions to get you a bit more warmed up for the event. And you will discuss those questions within the breakout rooms again for five minutes. And then we will come back to the main session and continue our conversation. So I hope you enjoy and I hope you have fun meeting your other fellow characters in our lovely story we have going on today and see you in five minutes.
Hello, welcome back to the main session. And now we have an opportunity to have maybe some of you participants share an interesting fact that you learned about either yourself or one other person. And you can uh, show that you would like to talk with everyone by using the raising hand function. I personally really like these questions. It looks like David Della Hunty is raising their hand. Yeah, by yeah, I learned when we <laughs> that is awesome. Any other people who are raising their hand would like to join us on the spotlight here? All right, looks like we have Ali. Thank you for joining us. What is one interesting thing you learned about somebody else? Well, we learned that none of us know what weebles are. Um, and I think we're all pretty keen to know what a weeble is now and why they don't fall over. <laughs> I believe David said it was a what was that again? Cow turd shaped like an egg. A cow turd shaped like an egg. That is in fact what a weeble is. <laughs> All right, would anybody else like to share an interesting fact that they learned? It looks like we have Q Young. Hey, um, in my breakout room, there was only there were only me and Vanessa, and she is currently um, now in Malawi. And interesting fact about her is that she has five dogs and three cats at uh, her parents' place. Uh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> and she has worked and studied in many different countries. That is really cool. And one thing we had in common was that we don't really like walking in the rain, but we like listening to the sound of the rain inside when we were warm and cozy. I also love listening to the rain. It just has that soothing sort of calming effect. Mm, love it, love it. Anyone else like to share? We actually have quite a bit of time here. Hello, Tugba. Welcome. Hello, Mel. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you again. What is one interesting thing that you learned? Um, she is a, a Pepsi lover, like me. And <laughs> who loves Pepsi? Do you like, do you like Pepsi? Do, do I you like prefer Pepsi or Coke? Mm, I would say, controversial opinion here, I'm more of a like Coca-Cola sort of fan. But there's also an argument to be made that there is Shame actually no difference. <laughs> oh <Yes>. my God. <laughs> yeah. you, oh, you should say uh, it is online. <laughs> right. Because Maybe it, if, it, uh, yeah, go on. Did they, did they pay you to uh, sponsor Pepsi and do a shout out at this event? Definitely, Ileana. I agree with you. There is a, a lot of difference. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, thank you so yeah, much for on. sharing that. Okay. All right. Lovely, lovely answers. Like, sounds like you guys are having a great time. I know I am. Uh, we're going to go on to the second set of questions. And these one second set of questions are a bit more to warm up your brain to the rest of the event. And so in a moment here, we will be breaking you out into the rooms once more for five minutes. And I'll see you then.
Kirsty McBean, thank you so much for joining. Ready to hear your excellent burning question today. Is it icebreaker happening now?
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And we have time for one person to share an answer from the questions that they had. We can get somebody spotlighted here. Anyone would like to volunteer, please raise your hand and you can share with the rest of us. All right, well, if nobody is interested in saying something, I would love to say that I chose to attend Burning Questions this year because uh, I had such a good time last year doing it, um, especially attending the workshops. Oh, it was just a lovely, lovely time. Um, yeah, so if um, without further ado, we are going to uh, go into talking about our schedule for today. So in a moment here, we will start the opening panel discussion at 1030. We'll have a one hour lunch break after that. Then we'll introduce the workshops, take a short break and start the workshops officially at 1.30 p.m. They will continue with short breaks in between until 5 p.m. Then we have our special grapple game event happening in the evening between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. And at the same time, just like in virtual morning coffee, all of our other breakout rooms will be open for people to continue their conversations, hang out, and even during that time, even have dinner with each other. Then starting at 7 p.m. and ending at 8 p.m., we'll be at, there'll be a networking event hosted on icebreaker.io. And I believe the link to that should be in your information package. And before we get started with the opening panel discussion, I would like to remind everyone to make sure your audio is muted, video is off, and for the full burning question Zoom experience, make sure on the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen, you are set to speaker and not gallery. Please ensure that the meeting hosts and other participants can see your name. And if you have any questions and concerns, please visit our website at burningq.com. That is burningq.com. And without further ado, I would like to introduce your panel moderator. He is one of our phenomenal event organizers this year, and he has been a really amazing influence on the event. And he is also a seasoned Burning Questions veteran. Matthew Zwicker, would you like to take it away? Hey. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much, Mel, for the lovely icebreaker session and the warm up. Like Mel said, I'm Matt Zwicker. I've been with Burning Questions only for the past two years now, but it's been a very fun and fulfilling past two years. So it's really, uh, really a pleasure to see many uh, familiar faces and familiar names here on the chat itself. So yes, uh, we're still waiting for one of our panelists to join. Um, like, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, have experienced some technical difficulties throughout uh, this whole situation of distance learning and utilizing Zoom a lot. So we're just going to take a few minutes to wait. But while we wait, uh, I do want to share with you the instructions of the panel right now. So like Mel said, right now we're doing the open panel discussion. We have four panelists coming in from across the globe, video chatting from many countries. Actually, there's only uh, two from Finland right now. Uh, one is currently in Kenya and the other one is currently in Belgium. But we'll get into our panelists here in a few seconds. Uh, I do want to tell you that this opening panel discussion is based on dialogic discourse, which means the equity and the equality of the status of voices. So we want to have uh, audience members like yourself participating in the chat, participating in the discussion. Uh, after the, after many of the questions, actually when we're doing each of the questions, there'll be a time for the audience, such as yourself, to engage with our panelists, either to ask them follow-up questions or to give additional responses or additional comments, however you see fit. Uh, if you want to give those additional comments, please 
in, do so by uh, raising your hand in the chat function, the participant function, um, and also putting your question or your comment into the chat. If you don't want to share at any point in time, please just use the chat function to add your thoughts or if any resources or other readings come to mind or maybe movies or songs, maybe dances or any other type of informational uh, related activities or links or materials, go ahead and add them into the chat. We would love to have you discussing with participants throughout this entire panel discussion. If you want to add those additional comments, raise your hand and uh, we'll have someone spotlight a video so that your video comes up live at the same time with the panelists. Um, but please keep your responses brief to about a minute per person or less. So the format of the first question will be this. We have a question that came from actually three of you, three of our participants who are here today. Um, really an excellent question that we merged together and it just goes over the, uh, the definition of accessibility and how our panelists would approach to define or redefine accessibility. Each of our panelists will give a response uh, to this question for no more than four minutes max. Uh, and our wonderful panelists already know that. Thank you so much for being here today. Then we are going to move on to questions two through five. And if we have time, we'll add in a question six and a question seven. Uh, but everything at and after question two will follow this format. We have one of you from the audience sharing one of your burning questions. And then I will indicate and direct that question to one panelist who will give their response. Then I'll open up the floor to the other panelists to share any responses that they might have. Uh, optional though for you panelists, if you don't want to share during the uh, open time to respond, you don't have to. If one of your lovely colleagues gave a very succinct and well formulated answer. But after the other panelists respond, we're gonna open the floor up to you, our audience members to engage with the panelists. So you can do so by raising your hand in the chat function, participant function, uh, and then uh, adding up comments to no more than one minute. Then we'll let the first panelist respond with the final comment to the audience's responses. And last but not least, we'll let the original questioner who asked the question uh, participate in uh, one final comment. I mean, one second. Yes. Ah, oh, good point. Thank you. I was just told that you will have to open up your video camera if you do want to share uh, and be spotlighted your video. So when you raise your hand, please do turn on your video. Thank you. So without further ado, that's our panel discussion today. We're actually uh, early, which is great for uh, event settings. Uh, so we have time for our panelists to introduce a little bit about themselves. So let's see our panelists today. Panelists, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining from where you are. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Calypso. Could you just give a brief introduction uh, about yourself and where you are? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thanks for the invitation. I've been following burning questions since last year. And currently I'm located in Turku. After I've been in the last eight years. I've been, I came also to do a master's degree here. Uh, in education and learning. Um, and then I stayed for my PhD, which I defended last year. Uh, well, no, it's almost, it's more than a year. In 2019, uh, which concentrated on thesis supervision process and relationship in the English media programs here in Finland. Now I have a few other projects uh, going on. Uh, yeah, it's been great to be here and meet all of you and all the uh, great participants and attendants. So thanks once more. It's great to have you, Dr. Calypso. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Magaga Enos, would you like to give a brief introduction uh, for yourself? Oh, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Magaga. Can you please unmute yourself in Zoom? Oh, Zoom. great. Sorry for that. Sorry That's for all good. that. I just did. Uh, great. Well, so once again, I'm saying thank you so much. I'm just, I just feel so honored to be part of this amazing discussion. So a little bit about myself is that I am Magaga Enos from Kenya and currently I'm, can you hear me well? 
Yep, we can hear you. Oh, great. So um, I, I got a special interest in special needs education. Currently, I'm a practicing teacher in special needs education in Kenya, and my area of specialty is emotional and behavioral disorders, how to handle learners with emotional and behavioral disorders. And I'm, I'm pursuing master's in um, Kenyan University, and I'm just in my second year so far in doing that. And um, I'm just happy to share, learn, and get to know people and share perspective today. And I'm just feeling so curious. I just can't wait. Thank you. Happy to have you here with us, Mr. Magaga. Thank you. Maya Karhunen, good to have right. you with us today. Would you like to give a short, brief introduction for yourself? Oh, and I believe, yeah, that's uh, we have to unmute yourself or could you unmute yourself in Zoom? Um, can't hear you quite yet. Um, in the Zoom chat, you should be able to, or not in the Zoom, if you open up the application at the bottom left corner of the screen, there should be the unmute. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, can you try now? Nope, not yet. We can see your lips moving. Um, this is good. Um, okay. Are you on the Zoom application? Uh, when you open that, we will. Aha. Okay, so, oh, ah, yes, so then we'll have to open up Zoom onto your, your desktop. So could you open up the Zoom application, probably at a tile at the bottom of the screen? So while you find that, PA, uh, good to have you with us. Could you share a brief introdu uh, introduction to, uh, on yourself, PA? Yes, the, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, Burning Questions is my first. Um, I'm based in Belgium and I am a co-founder of a nonprofit which is called uh, My Machine and uh, we're, we're operating in education. Um, it's a collaboration between primary schools, secondary schools and universities that together build dream machines invented by the kids in primary schools. So that's what we do here. But we do it in different countries in actually in 12 countries already as we speak uh, on four continents. Amazing. It's great to have you here with us today, PA. Thank you for being here. Uh, Maya, would you like to try your mic again? Oh, not in Zoom yet. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, in your email, uh, oh, yeah, are you sending it in Skype? Great. Okay. Um, Maya, we are sending you the link to Zoom in Skype. Um, so if you open up Skype and go to the chat, you should get the link to Zoom. Um, thank you to all of you lovely audience members as well for um, letting us work through these technical difficulties. Uh, it is what it is. So uh, panelists, it's great to have you here today. Uh, what time is it for uh, each of you right now while we just wait uh, to get that link opened up? Uh, Maga Magaga, what time is it for you right now? Okay, it looks like we are having uh, trouble, uh, also technical difficulties with Magaga's video. I see. Okay, well, it looks like his video dropped. Isn't this the isn't this the, the life with uh, with technical technical issues? Hey, but we're good. What time is it for you now, Dr. Clipso? Although I guess you're in Finland, but for the rest of our audience members, so that you can tell them, what time is it for you? Yeah, it's ten thirty nine now. So yeah, same time like Olu, and uh, same time for in the same time zone with my home country, Cyprus. Aha. Okay, great. And then PA, how about for you? Uh, for me, it's nine thirty nine. So one hour behind uh, Finland. Okay, and so like I said, uh, originally from um, Cyprus, and you're currently uh, in Belgium right now. Is that right, Pia? Uh, I'm. I was born in Belgium, and I am in Belgium. Ah, perfect. Great, great. And then Magaga, what time is it for you right now? 
it is um is 11:40 11 40. down in, in kenya right now is that correct yeah i'm ken in kenya i'm sure you're having a much warmer weather than we are up here in finland so it, that would be it seems uh, so it seems so right <laughs> we can send some snow to you yeah um <laughs> Uh, are you up and running? How are you looking as well, Ridpon? I'm like, still getting the link up and running. That's completely fine. That's really good. So today, we I just want to go in briefly and discuss uh, a bit about our participants. Uh, all of you who have registered, of course, for being here, this is how you receive the Zoom links, have submitted two burning questions. And so in total, we have had over 350 questions submitted by participants. So thank you to all of you who answered really, uh, or who asked very thought-provoking burning questions. We're gonna ask that you would share those questions uh, in the breakout rooms, uh, during lunch, during dinner, during the breaks. Uh, please engage in conversation with each other because it's it, within the dialogue that we have with each other where true learning happens. Uh, so, I do want to say that out of those 350 plus questions, uh, seven of those questions were specifically chosen for our four panelists today. Uh, they, in, these four or five questions, seven questions, if we can get to the seven, at least the first five questions uh, encompass a broad range of topics in, under the umbrella of accessibility. So. We are going to try right now to test Maya Karhunet. Microphone, are you up and running, Maya? Uh, yes, I think it should work now. Excellent, yeah. sounds great. Great. Great, so we have to give a, a little question about yourself. It's great to have you today. Yeah, so um, I come from um, a Culture for All service, which is, um, uh, organization funded by the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland. And in Culture for All, we work extensively with accessibility, diversity, inclusivity issues in the arts and cultural field. Um, and one of the very many topics that we work with is the um, access in education. Um, uh, accessibility in art and culture education in all levels um, of education. And I have been working here since one year um, almost on a specific project that focuses on um, the accessibility of um, and inclusivity of disabled. Um, artists and art aspiring uh, disabled people. And um, yeah, there are a lot of issues with that. So <laughs> there is a lot to do. Yes. Well, it's great to have you. It Thank sounds, you. Uh, Thank you. I'm sorry for the really good boots on the ground uh, for not just this event and accessibility in general, but really working with your hands on in education and within these projects. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Of course. So without further ado, let's dive into question one. Are you guys ready? Our beloved panelists. OK, let's ask this question then. The first question is a conglomeration of similar questions from two of our very own here in, actually three of our very own here in Olu, uh, including Mel Natuha and Anka Teodisu. The question for our four panelists to answer for four minutes each uh, with no audience interaction in the first question. So just four minutes of your response. The question number one is, in light of your own field of work, research and or context, whether that be in the global south or the global north or et cetera, what does accessibility really mean? And how would you approach to define or redefine accessibility? PA, would you like to answer this first for four minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, 
maybe just saying that um, I am here to learn a lot about uh, accessibility. Um, I don't think I am the biggest expert on the planet on the theme. Um, so I'm here to learn. Um, in our case, as I explained, we are building stuff. Um, so we are engaging uh, young children in primary school, asking them if we could build a dream machine for you, what would that dream machine do? In step number two, we bring in university students and they help uh, to, to make a concept out of that idea. And in step number three, technical secondary level students or vocational students build a working prototype. So we go from idea to concept to working prototype in one school year. And we do this with lots of schools at the same time. So we are uh, building things. And um, what I found, uh, we started it in Belgium uh, where I'm based, but what I found uh, it, um, strange a little bit was that uh, certainly here in Belgium, people were, when, when we started this a couple of years back, people were um, saying that building stuff, they related that to boys, to men. And we got some, uh, so a typical gender uh, uh, approach saying that, uh, some people saying that um, uh, they thought that what we were, what we are doing with my machine was great to also include women into the story of, you know, what people call maker centered learning. And I thought that was really, uh, the, you know, I never thought about that, that building stuff would be, would be related to a specific gender. And that's when I started to actually really uh, think about that in, in the light of our own work, is making sure that we, uh, we do open up uh, or, uh, actually for anybody to join uh, my machine with their classroom, with their schools, um, whether that would be gender, whether that would be uh, other types of uh, accessibility or inaccessibility. Um, and the way we approach this is that we we don't uh, in in our in our field of work we don't um we don't talk about it in in terms of um we don't talk about we don't go into schools saying um uh you know today we are going to do something about uh, we're going to build a dream machine you can invent a dream machine um, and we don't mention, emphasize and mention it that, hey, especially to you young girls here in the classroom, this will be interesting and stuff like that. We don't do that. Uh, it's not about uh, talking about it. We just, we just uh, go into the primary classroom asking this open question, what is your dream machine? Um, and we, we just make sure that, uh, you know, the quiet ones, the shy ones, the loud ones, uh, boys or girls alike, it doesn't matter, uh, that all of them are engaged in, in, in the whole process. So for us, uh, in reality, it's more about just making sure that everybody is, is, um, is with us. Um, and we actually do collaborate, for example, also with children who are in hospitals for, for longer periods of times for, for cancer. Uh, or, or you know, it's people with you know young people with special needs and all stuff like that. So we just bring them into our process without emphasizing that we're doing it. We just we don't really talk about it. We just do it. And the final thing before my time is up, I, I wanted to say that for me, accessibility as an organization, it means that you have to. It has to be in your decision making structure. It has to be in your day to day operations, and it has to be in your communication. Great. Thank you very much, PA, for the beautiful response and for sharing the background with my machine and how that relates to accessibility. Uh, Maya Karunen, next, would you mind uh, sharing your response to this answer on what does accessibility really mean and how would you approach to define or redefine accessibility? Um, yeah, so um, in Culture for All, we approach um, accessibility from uh, the point of view of um, kind of all the minorities. So we try to um, see um, very many perspectives, um, both very practically. So it, and then in a more, uh, say, mental level. Um, so in the culture, 
services. It can mean it was very good what um, uh, the speaker right before me um, said as the last thing. So, um, so yes, it's a. Uh, it's not only words, it's actions, it's very concrete things that either either um, exist or don't exist. So either there is an obstacle for somebody to participate or there isn't. It's, it's many times very concrete. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we look at it, uh, both practically so for example for disabled people it means um, uh, participation as a consumer of art but also of maker of art um, and um, as a decision maker uh, so what was said before is very important that uh, for example in art institutions in um, uh, art, that art educators also hire um, people of minorities um, and that we have also in decision-making positions people um, who belong to different minorities. So um, it's also access to those positions, uh, to the positions of power. Um, Yes, but it's uh, it's something that is also very much defined in law in Finland. Um, we have a law um, on equality, <laughs> which uh, requires um, a certain level of accessibility, and we have a problem with the implementation of that. So law is quite good, but um, there is so much lacking in then actually fulfilling uh, the requirements of the law. And for example, when it comes to uh, digital accessibility, we also have a law, we have, um, uh, it it's come from, comes from the European Union, but then it is uh, adapted in the Finnish law. And uh, this also sets, uh, requirements uh, and it's quite recent so it's still on the process of uh, all different institutions and organizations actually implementing uh, what they need to do uh, by law. I see that there is a question but I guess it, it will come later then that we answer <laughs> this. It will. Thank you so much, Maya, for providing that. It's very interesting that you brought up uh, decision making as well, access to decision making, especially for minorities um, and including governmental law and the benefit of it being there, but also the limitations if if uh, fulfilling the law is found lacking. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Magago, would you like to give your uh, sentiments on this question on how would you approach to define or redefine accessibility? Oh, I am so sorry. Could you please unmute yourself in Zoom? Yeah, sorry about that once again. Well, thank you so much. Um, I work with an organization called Beads for Education. Beads for Education is an a USA based organization that has most impact in Kenya, Africa. Basically, in beats, uh, we support education of girls from vulnerable communities in Kenya and give them or give them the opportunity to have access to quality education. So in light of my work or my field of work, I think education or uh, accessibility uh, could to me mean acknowledging that uh, basic needs are also educational needs. I think um, when we have educational programs, they shouldn't really um, tackle education in a vacuum. But uh, we realize that um, most of the barriers to education could be socioeconomic status and financial needs. And I think accessibility is acknowledging that actually uh, basic needs are also educational needs. 
And again, I think in Kenya, as um, when I look at education in Kenya, and I think um, what as it, what we as educators are really trying much to actually realize that uh, what to trying much to make uh, increase or improve the value of education should be to encourage opportunities that uh, facilitate creative thinking and equal access to decision making privileges because we realize that um, like from my line of work girls from this vulnerable and so to say Maasai communities have they don't have that uh, opportunity to actually make decisions of their own but mostly decisions are made to them by their elderly parents where they are arranged for forced marriages or rather subjected to you know female genital mutilation all against their will so i think their eyes to know what is best for them their eyes to decide what is best for them is no longer there and i think that's a barrier and that's against what i would really focus on as accessibility so i think accessibility should also have much to do with uh, equal opportunities that um, encourage creative thinking and also decision making privileges to all learners and again uh, on another dimension as uh, i will also look at accessibility as being able to give special regards to sp um, social economical needs of uh, uh, of education or other of learners when we look at uh, people getting we getting people from these awkward situations like forced marriages imagine a girl from a forced marriage rescued and brought to school this student will not just be a student as a student the first day we there is so much uh, emotional disorientation there is so much you know behavioral kind of imbalance and before we can actually make this student be in a class we should be able that we take into consideration the emotional and behavioral uh um uh impact of all that maybe they come from or rather what that uh befell them so i think being able to think of or rather i come up with strategies to actually um put emphasis on emotional well-being of the learners can also serve to give students equal and equitable opportunities to take full advantage of their education or the learning process so in summary i look at um, and i'm open to many more but so far um, i look at accessibility to to focus on these three areas one acknowledging that basic needs are actually educational needs two um, uh, providing opportunities that encourage creative and equal decision making and finally three for this for, for today i think i'm um, also looking at the social emotional needs of learners thank you thank you very much thank you very much Magaga, for the beautiful insights and for those three points i love that first point especially to recognize that basic needs are educational needs thank you for that uh, last but definitely not least dr Clipso, would you like to give your answer on to this question how would you approach to define or redefine accessibility Yes, uh, starting, uh, I would like to say like Piet, I also, I am a learner, a learner here and uh, been learning from what the other open panelists have been saying. I, I think that there are uh, many definitions of accessibility. There's no lack uh, on that or lack of studies analyzing and examining this concept. But I find interesting how the meaning of accessibility changes and uh, weights differently. Uh, not only based on the context uh, we are talking about it, but based on who is using the term accessibility, for what purposes or reasons, with what kind of uh, power, uh, narrative or discourse. So from my own field of, of work and uh, teaching background, accessibility is strongly connected to the uh, core values and characteristic of multicultural education and culturally and linguistically responsive teaching. So it's strongly uh, connected with education for all, equity, social justice. So first, when I think of accessibility, I think the systematic barriers across contexts, but especially in education, 
uh, that um, deprive and oppress uh, individuals, communities, uh, minorities. So these barriers that uh, hold back um, people's rights, that people's uh, that do not embrace uh, people's background, skills, their desires. So in the in this uh, context, uh, in the educational context, uh, uh, these barriers uh, hold back students' learning and their own uh, development. But uh, then I think of all the ways and steps that people take this uh, inspiring togetherness and the strong individuals who advocate with uh, small or big steps, uh, small big actions uh, to ensure access uh, for everyone. So I would think that perhaps even this event uh, uh, that we are all here today, um, this event that examines education through the lens of accessibility is a small act of advocacy, maybe a big act of advocacy for enhancing access for all. Would, wouldn't you think, uh, do you agree with that or not? Uh, I'd like to hear later. But uh, in higher education, I try to see uh, accessibility and implemented in my teaching uh, by building a strong and supportive community between my students and within, between themselves and build this trust, uh, uh, trusted relationship with each other so they can feel comfortable to speak up, to be themselves. But then it, this also gives me the opportunity to see the individual, see uh, the individual needs, the supports that, if, that a person needs, the encouragement. So not only uh, speaking about uh, the infrastructures, which are really important, but seeing how to make learning accessible for each uh, individual. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you so much, Dr. Clip. So especially the point that you said about these systematic barriers that uh, oppress and hold back people's rights and ability to access their own rights to learning. Thank you very much for all of these responses, uh, our panelists. Uh, uh, definitely so much to chew on and it, just like what Dr. Calypso invited all of you to do as audience members is to agree or to disagree and to vocalize uh, these thoughts and these positions on all of these responses that you hear today, whether that be in the chat right now as I'm looking and I see a great action in the chat. Thank you. Please, please keep that up. Keep up the uh, discussions in the chat in, uh, in right now also on the audience floor. We're going to open up now to question number two coming in from Kyuyang, University of Oulu, I believe. So uh, do we have Kyuyang already here? Uh, please do turn on your camera and unmute yourself. I'm just waiting now. To... But um, the, it says the host has stopped the video function. So I, I'm afraid I can't turn on the camera. Okay. We've opened it you should be able to open your video now excellent sounds good so q young would you like to share your question uh with any context uh for about a minute go ahead okay i'm i'm, I'm so sorry just a second please that's all right great to have you here this morning Thank you. I just had my question right here and I lost it. I'm so sorry. No problem. We have time. Again, all of these questions have come in from uh, people around the world. So thank you for submitting questions and um, engaging in the chat. Kyung, looks like you're ready. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, so um, hello, my name is Kyung Jung and I am from, I'm originally from South Korea, but I am studying intercultural teacher education here in University of Oulu, Finland. So my question is that um, what is the most urgent problem to be solved in education during and after a pandemic situation and how can we solve this problem? Excellent question. I think that's on the forefront of our minds right now since we're living in it. Uh, I think this might be best answered by uh, Dr. Calypso, since I believe that you are working on some projects right now that's looking into uh, higher education and uh, students, uh, I guess not phenomenography, but students' perception on their own learning within the pandemic. Would you like to uh, answer this question or approach an answer within four minutes? 
Yes, um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, currently, uh, I am working on, uh, on a project with uh, my fellow doctor, uh, my fellow doc uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Suvi Gokila. So we have been examining the impact uh, and um, the last year during the pandemic and how it has influenced uh, students' uh, studies, learning, um, finances, uh, socializing. So we have been going through the, the, the pandemic and webinars and learning more and more about this all around the world. Uh, now, um, to answer the question, I think what this pandemic perhaps has highlighted, uh, and not that uh, this problem was not here, it's just it highlighted it and it reminded us in case uh, some of us have forgotten, um, that there are multiple uh, types of inequalities uh, found in education and in educational settings taking from uh, primary school until uh, higher education. Uh, here in Finland, we have the privilege of uh, having or find, finding a wireless network in cheap prices or for free in central locations and buildings, but in other regions of the world and uh, even inside Europe, but especially even in other countries uh, outside Europe, internet prices are, are very high one gigabyte can cost a lot of money. So downloading the learning material or following a webinar or an online class is very pricey and almost impossible. So we could focus uh, on the materials, uh, the webinars or online classes that were not possible for, uh, for many, but we could also think uh, this kind of shift that happened during the pandemic, this virtual online shift and consider who could not access this and what kind of gaps have now been created because of this uh, lack of accessibility. Um, same for the technology. I think we have seen families without devices or with one device and three students. Um, and I take it from one real life example, one of my students were, was asking for extension of deadline as home, as she was home with multiple siblings, uh, she couldn't study until late at, at night. Uh, we have seen teachers struggling to cope between family and work duties. So there are various problems, the infrastructure, the access uh, to this infrastructure, the lack of support, and I'd say both for students and teachers. So all these inequalities need to be tackled. Um, lastly, one major problem in education and, and this pandemic led to is uh, isolation and loneliness for both for students and teachers. And learning, we should remember, it takes place through interaction, through communication, through emotional and intellectual engagement. So I hope post pandemic, we can tackle these inequalities, but also build strong structures and strong communities, both for teachers and students. Thank you very much, Dr. Calypso. A very well, all encompassing answer. I will now open up the floor to our other panelists to share any comments or responses uh, or thoughts to this. Uh, up to two minutes. So, uh, Magaga, do you have any thoughts on this? I can't hear. Oh, I'm so sorry. You'll have to unmute yourself on Zoom. We'd love to hear from you. Go ahead. I promise this is the last time you're reminding me. I'll, be, I'll keep an eye on that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, well, um, like I said, I, 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 I really I am in so much agreement with Doctor. But actually, looking at the context of Africa and Kenya to be specific, I realized that during the pandemic, the uh, the major problem that realized as educators was uh, there was lack of you know, self learning and self assessment because educators relied virtually much on remote learning, and if there is no self interest on the learner side, you realize that the effectiveness of this remote learning was not also not in um, uh, was also in jeopardy. So what COVID has, has actually taught us, has taught me as an educator, is that most students are overly dependent on their teachers and can hardly can hardly do much on their own. So uh, and notably, this was a major obstacle in remote learning. So I think I think uh, 
you realize that uh, the system, education system, mostly in Kenya, is um, we have what you call rot memorization, reading to the tests. You see, and this doesn't this discourages creative creative kind of learning, research based learning. And you realize that in this, there is the learners are not actively involved in their learning process. So I think. Um, there are many solutions, but uh, the one that comes to my mind as an educator is uh, how about structuring educational, uh, uh, structure and coming up with instructional delivery methods that promote independency skills. Um, and again, by effectively as educators taking role in being facilitators in the learning process, whereby we have the learners to uh, take charge of their learning process to improve skills like they feel competent and they feel capacitated to do learning on their own and only look at a teacher as a facilitator. Thanks, I only wanted to add that. Thank you for the chance. Thank you very much, Magaga. Uh, Maya, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, I mean, there was a question also kind of relating to the pandemic situation in the context of distance learning and then how, how that might look from the perspective of uh, uh, disabled learners. So, and if, if there should be some new local laws passed I think, um, I mean, I guess this relates a little bit to what we have to this question. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a challenge. The, the whole digital accessibility is a huge challenge. And um, in many ways, the, dis the situation of distance learning, it also makes it easier. It can make easier for uh, disabled people to participate because they don't have to leave their apartments. <laughs> um, uh, but then it's also it's it's not um, that in this way we can um, solve the whole problem of accessibility or the lack of thereof. Um, yeah, I mean we need uh, accessible digital learning and digital events and then we need also accessible accessible physical reality so um but but, but what comes to the law i think i think um i mean just to in, i think to implement the current law i mean that would be make such a huge difference already i'm not sure if it's about writing new new um a new law, but it, I think it's more about just uh, uh, fulfilling what we already have. And working with what we have at this point in time and maximizing it. That's a good point. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Uh, Pia, do you have any uh, comments on this question? Well, I'd like to add that um, what I hope that we learn as humanity um, is to learn to embrace complexity. I never believe in a one solution fits all, uh, whether that would be in education or, or, or in anything else, um, or on the theme of accessibility or whatever. So le learning to embrace complexity means that um, we, we should walk away from the idea that if you have a problem, that we directly go to one solution, problem, you know, arrow to a solution and that's it. For example, problem, we have a pandemic solu solu uh, uh, and for education solution is, let's go to Zoom or Skype or online, you know. So there it is, problem was a pandemic, solution is Zoom and that's it, you know. And, uh, you know, the message to all the teachers and all the students, whether that would be primary, secondary, higher education would be like, okay, there you go. We have a solution, it's called Zoom, it's called Skype, go for it. Um, where I think it's much more complicated. We, we know that the learning process is indeed, it is already has been mentioned. It's not just about 
you know, a teacher spilling out knowledge that the students needs to just, you know, um, adapt to and, and learn, uh, you know, indeed a teacher should be a, more, more about a coach. Learning is a social, you know, we learn a lot more when we engage socially and stuff like that. So uh, we need to, as a society as a whole, we need to embrace complexity and say, hey, you know what? Things are complex. Um, and um, it means that we need to find simple solutions, but to find simple solutions is an extremely complex uh, you know, way of getting there to get to a simple solution. And once you have a simple solution, people think like, okay, so that was easy, but it was not easy to reach to the simple solution. But you, at first you need to embrace the fact that it's complex and so that we need to address issues from you know, almost from individual to individual, from teacher to teacher, find solutions that work for everybody, for that type of teacher or for a different kind of students, find different kind of solutions. Utilizing inclusivity within accessibility. Great point. Thank you very much, PA. Uh, we'll right now open up the floor to all of you audience members who would like to interact with our panelists or provide your own responses to this question or comment on some things that the panelists have said or that you would like to dive in. We're starting three minutes in now for that. But if there's no one, we're gonna move on, but I'll leave the floor open just to allow you to think and to breathe a bit or to find the reactions option and choose the raise your hand function so you can interact with our panelists. I must say that all of you provided excellent answers uh, encompassing such uh, a difficult question, since this question really does impact all of our realities right now, um, if not in one capacity, but in many. It looks like we have uh, one participant, uh, Irisa, great to have you here today. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and interact with our panelists uh, for uh, less than one minute. Go ahead. Okay. I have a question for Maya about the accountability between Finnish um, the laws are well, written very well, but the implementation, because um, I have two disabled children and I find that the laws are wonderful. The implementation is silly and shocking. <laughs> oh, that is a difficult question. Thank you for that. Uh, would you mind putting that question uh, in the chat as well? That way we can note that. And put in the Finnish context, what do you think could help with accountability for laws that are not well implemented? Um, uh, yeah, I'm, Maya, I'm so sorry. I would love to give you a chance to respond, but we're just going to open up the floor to some uh, more audience yeah. uh, responses. So, uh, Irissa, please do put that question into the chat. That is worthwhile uh, keeping and diving into. If you would like to interact with Maya, please uh, private. Uh, or directly message her in the Zoom chat option, but do post your question to everyone. That way we can um, interact with that. And then perhaps later you, well, both of you can interact in the individual group uh, or group discussion rooms. Um, another comment from any participants. Looks like we just have enough time uh, just for one more brief comment. All right. So uh, looks like no one else. We will then move on to Dr. Calypso to add some final wrap up uh, comments to everything that's been shared. I know it's a lot to uh, recap or respond to, but do you have any final uh, closing comments for two minutes? Um, well, my thoughts, uh, especially when, when Piet mentioned about the easy solutions, I was thinking how in the societies we live now in the type of society with consumerism and how um, our uh, expectations and our lifestyles are so uh, pro and and uh, um, in need of these kind of uh, easy solutions. How how challenging, perhaps, or how uh, in a both good way and bad way, um, it is to uh, re-emphasize uh, that education does take time and. Uh, there won't be easy solutions, and but I think this was mainly um, linked with the uh, people who are in a power position or the ministries or the media that they want this kind of 
uh, flashy, flashy titles that we've been doing great or this kind of discourses, but um, everyone has really made very interesting contributions. So this has been a very interesting uh, uh, question. So thanks to whoever uh, submitted it. Thank you very much, Dr. Calypso. And Kyung, did you want to add any final words or thoughts to this? Or uh, that is awesome. Uh, no, thank you. But I, I just want to uh, say thank you to the panelists for answering my question. That was really um, very helpful. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Q Young. I see we have a question in the in the chat about uh, letting Maya answer. I would love to. We do have to move on to other questions already in the panel discussion. Uh, so sorry, I do, I must moderate though. That is a beautiful question. I wish we could get there because it's important. But this is why we are doing this burning question event to ask these type of questions. Um, please now we are going to go on to question three from uh, Giacomo Serra. Uh, Giacomo, do you have any? Uh, you have any video capabilities? Yes, you're there. Great yes. to have you for question number three. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Giacomo from Italy and I study education and globalization at the University of Oulu. My burning question is, how can we monitor and foster school connectedness and social emotional support from a distance? And with the term school connectedness, I mostly meant the way children feel that their school and teachers care for them as individuals and care about their learning. It is an important factor of children's resilience and, to get, and together with the perceived social emotional support. So I would like to, to know your ideas about it. Thanks. Wow, uh, deep question on social emotional learning. Uh, I believe that this question should be first answered by Magaga. I know since you have a background in behavioral uh, disabilities um, as well as emotional needs. Uh, so Magaga Enos, for four minutes, please. Thank you for the question. Actually, it's a good question. Well, um, I think um, when we look at uh, the issue of school connectedness, uh, I think, and uh, I think that opening up to collaborate, collaborative activities between the school and community and the parents serves to, you know, foster a relationship and create like a triangle where we have students, we have teachers and we have parents that can actually um, in the mind of the child know that, you know, I um, cared, my well-being is a, a factor that is important not only to me, not only to my father, not only to my parents or other guardians, but also the school and the society as a well. whole. So if we can have a, co a collaborative shift of some responsibilities, um, from the education sector, maybe to other uh, local agencies and maybe service providers, the community, and these service providers, of course, the immediate funds we're talking about the parents could also help much. When we look at the pandemic situation where learners have to distance themselves from school because of barriers of having to adhere to COVID protocols, you see there is disconnect between teachers and uh, learners and the normal routines that you use to foster or uh, to, to foster resilience or development of resilience within the learners, it's um, kind of getting weak. So I think, I think, and that, uh, and I'm open to ideas that when we look at um, way, uh, ways of um, uh, clearly defining and differentiating adult roles towards areas in need of greatest attention when the learners at home uh, by the school, that can actually uh, function to bridge the gap uh, at a distance at a distance maintaining connection and checking the well-being as as a part of a school program checking the well-being maybe through calls the way the normal channels that parents teachers communicate or with uh, communicate with if this could be intensified then at least the learners will not see themselves as people having their lives on their own. But I find this question really interesting and I'm really much open to suggestion from my fellow panel, panelists and also participants. And I'm really open to hear many more ideas because it is on my line of interest too. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And sorry about that. We were just experiencing some technical difficulties with that transition. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Um, I would like to open up the floor now um, to any three of you other panelists who would like to share additional comments. Again, you don't have to if you would like to uh, pass and move on. Um, but uh, Maya, would you have any comments to add for two minutes? I'm also happy to pass on. I can give to others. I'm, I'm writing an answer to Irisa's comment on the chat. <laughs> so maybe I focus on that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Pia, do you have any uh, comments or thoughts on this for two minutes? Well, um, it's a very important question and it, it addresses for me um, a bit of um, the essence of learning, the essence of education. Um, we should indeed uh, not isolate um, the knowledge transfer aspect of education. I, I hear lots of people talking about education as being about knowledge transfer. And um, the, the key thing is that this is true, but it's certainly not the only aspect of education. Education should, should address a human being, a young human being, a student, um, uh, as a human being, as a whole. So it, it is about social, emotional um, um, well-being. It is about uh, learning to uh, be part of a society. What does it mean? What does it mean to be connected to um, not, not just your school, but your peers, your parents, your friends, your, your, your neighborhood, your country, and as humanity as a whole. And so I think uh, education should really focus on all of that and in my experience um, I still see too many schools and too many education systems having too much of a focus on just the knowledge transfer and even in times like these uh, you know all the other aspects are so often uh, forgotten but but not just in times like these just even before it and afterward uh, unfortunately I think it will still happen so it is a, a, an extremely important um, issue to tackle and I, 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 I thank um, uh, Magaga for actually also addressing the fact that it's a, it's the triangle of teacher a student and the parents and and talking about responsibilities on the whole of the of the young student and and the well-being of the young student a holistic approach. Thank you very much, PA. Uh, last but not least, Calypso, would you have uh, any comments you would like to add to this question? Uh, I'll be very short. Um, I agree both with Magaga and Piet that shifting the focus to the well being of the students uh, is, especially from a distance, uh, is extremely important and providing quite, quite uh, many opportunities to share these open spaces, to share uh, their emotions, uh, what they've been going uh, through, even daily, daily things, small and big. Um, I noticed uh, in the last month how creativity has also uh, came more into focus. Um, so teachers have been, and, and students and parents have become more creative. So the use of, of of online tools, but also traditional tools uh, to keep this uh, connectness and support going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Now I would like to open up the floor to our, uh, to our audience members to interact. Um, it looks like we have uh, many, many questions. Uh, Elena, would you like to share your thoughts on this or Betty um, as well. Go ahead and raise your hat, uh, raise your hand in the chat function or the reactions function. So we can spotlight you, turn on your video. If not, I can read them right now. It looks like Alina is now raising your hand. Thank you. Uh, please do start your video if possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Alina, for one minute. Hi, so I would just state my question again. Um, there it is. 
So when embracing the diversity of solutions that Piet was talking about, uh, what can we do to avoid recreating accessibility barriers by assuming who or what groups need a certain kind of accessibility solution? And especially uh, as a possible future educator, I would like to know what questions we can ask ourselves to actually add accessibility and not just assumptions. Thank you very much, Alina, for that response. Um, I, Betty cannot open her video, but I do believe that you can unmute yourself and you can uh, ask just with your mic then. Can you yeah. do that? Okay, thank Go you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, because one of the panelists mentioned about it might be diverse in different contexts. So uh, according to that, we have a lot of discussion, but we don't never ask about how this, how those dilemmas and obstacles occurred in different region or different areas or even different contexts. So even though that we always say, try to have different perspective from different place, or even like within the conference like this, uh, why we never ask these simple questions. Maybe uh, because uh, this is the reason why those dilemmas and obstacles occurred. This is my question, thank you. Thank you very much, Betty, for your question. Uh, really good responses and many other good questions in the chat. Thank you everyone for interacting there. Uh, Magaga, do you have any thoughts uh, to wrap up uh, this question, or I guess not to wrap up because we still have so much to unpack, but do you have any uh, final thoughts uh, with this question for two minutes? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it is interesting what is coming up uh, when Dr. mentioned about creativity. Um, I, think, I think when social emotional problems or social emotional issues have requires not one particular solution or not one particular group of responsibility from one angle, but at least it is like um, we have teams working together collaboratively to reach, uh, to actually make a situation better, if not to solve it. And um, I think um, creative thinking, so to say, can help people or particular learners in question have, go, have many uh, have have alternative ways to handle situations because when um, emotionally you when is uh, sometimes they find themselves in emotional dilemma when they think that the solution is either they either this or this so they are now blocked from seeing other angles altogether but now um, teaching or rather encouraging creativity and critical thinking uh, or rather creative thinking also open ideas to how learners or la or students can actually handle situations so I think um, and uh, I really appreciate um, uh, uh, comments or addition made by Pip. And I think, yes, the triangle parents, community teachers have to work and share responsibilities to ensure that actually this uh, issue is made, uh, is brought, actually is made better. The problem is made better and the feeling and the emotional concerns are even made better in any learning institution. And it's not just, should not just focus on transfer or knowledge or other knowledge sharing that's all. thank you so much i really appreciated all those comments adding to mine or again thank you very much magaga for the final response um giacomo do you have any final thoughts for our panelists or to the answers given no thanks Th thank thank you all for your answers thanks thanks a lot great thank you giacomo for the thought-provoking question next up uh, I do want to invite to uh, the floor, Kirsty McBean. Kirsty McBean, if you could please turn on your video and share your thought provoking burning question for question number four. Thanks, Matt. Sorry about the uh, technology, but the video doesn't want to work today. Um, I'm a secondary teacher in Australia and I teach mainly math science. And my question came out of um, remote learning and teaching, which is how can educators incorporate accessible education in with the learning styles or preferences of students? So I just want to give you a bit of a background to this. 
Um, I'm from a state called Victoria and we had a six month uh, hard lockdown. So students and teachers uh, were remote learning for two terms. So for half of the year and I was teaching maths and I found it really difficult to engage my students with the content um, and with the curriculum, uh, which we were pretty much instructed that we still had to teach. So um, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how can we make, you know, education accessible, but also link it in with the learning styles of, of um, students. And I do know that Dr. Clipso was talking about um, learning through communicating with others and engaging socially uh, through the learning process. And Pierre, you know, you also mentioned about one solution does not fit all. And that's very true. But I just wanted to hear um, the panelists uh, ideas on on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Uh, wow, what a hard question to approach. Uh, so many different uh, ways, like you said, with a with the different answers that they provided before. Um, how about we go to Maya Karhunen, because you have had uh, boots on the ground uh, working with projects, uh, I believe with educators on accessible education. So uh, Maya, would you like to please share for four minutes? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, we are not an academic uh, project. We are very practical project and also I, I, I'm not sure if I can answer uh, so extensively it's, it's quite specific <laughs> uh, where um, my knowledge is but uh, but yeah I think it was yeah it was mentioned um, that in addition to thinking about the um, uh, the infrastructure of accessibility it's also then what happens emotionally what happens socially also what was discussed in the previous question and um, when it comes to um, disabled students in art education which I can talk about um, well there is just uh, just to mention shortly that uh, it, it's very rare still that even a, a disabled person can um, um, apply and be accepted to this kind of education because already the, like I, for example, I'm a dancer, uh, a physically disabled dancer. And when I applied to um, art education, high, high art education, uh, it was said to me or that you cannot because you cannot be here because uh, you will never pass the criteria that we set for our students. Uh, so all the physical classes you would fail, but then this is such a contradiction then that it is an art school and art art is it is not limited in that way. So um, uh, yeah, so what we are trying to do is also to help uh, our educators how to make um, uh, the entrance exams, the, the auditions or whatever um, accessible, like how, and this is totally possible. I, it, it, it is done in many European countries and then it just comes down to questions about what do we consider skill, what do we consider quality, what do we consider, um, uh, yeah, the criteria for professionality to be, and there it can be so many things. So, um, yeah, but then during education, uh, how can we uh, take into account um, uh, different kinds of students? I think, um, yeah, like one of the things that we have been working with is kind of um, how educators could during the studies offer, for example, mentoring um, to the students, but then also to the teachers alike, because um, 
yeah, it's they also need it's it's not only the student who needs to fit into the reality of the education, but also that um, just the student with their with their needs and with their I wouldn't maybe talk, or I'm not capable to talk about learning styles, but uh, with what um, so also the the student informs the educator it's it goes in both directions uh yeah so i think mentoring is really important and um yeah making sure that the student like also doesn't need to take too big a responsibility of uh informing the educator about accessibility issues because everybody still has a right to be a student and not to take too big responsibility Thank you very much, Maya, for the response. Excellent. Uh, Malgaga, Enos, do you have any thoughts on this question? Y yes, of course. And um, thank you so much, Maya. I can resonate to your point and actually your point on handling that question. And well, I think um, for starters, when we decide, when this, we restarted by trying to see how we can redefine or that we can approach accessibility and i mentioned a point a point on uh, creating opportunities that encourage creative uh, creative thinking and equal decision making uh, privileges well i think um oh well uh, allow me to just answer this question in the context of where i am my immediate surrounding and the current of learning preferences or styles that are in practice and I see, I think, I think there is a gap when um, we have a bulky curriculum and we have to approach learning and we only have to, and most likely what happens, most, mo mostly what happens is reading to the test. So most learners actually just read to the test. So in that you realize that there is no, there is no creative thinking. So the teacher is like the sole source of knowledge and broadcast the knowledge to the learners. And that doesn't make an impact as much because we are only manufacturing machines to you know it's not like you will not we are not cultivating global citizens who are capable to adjust and adapt to changes in the world so i think um, when i look at this question how educators can incorporate access for education with the learning styles or preference of students i think educators and as educators have the role to look at um, approach learning and acknowledge that learning is about the learners and not about the teachers or rather not about themselves and uh, i realize this uh, when we incorporate student-centered teaching method met, met, met pedagogies or methodologies it encourages it empowers the learners to take charge of their learning process whereby they can and when that one happens each learner feels like he or she is part of the learning process and to me that is accessibility they can actually access and take full advantage of their learning process so i think critical and creative thinking and methodologies that encourage this is a way to go so those learning styles that acknowledges or appreciate or recognize that the learner is the important person here and we need to make learning process about him or her do play a role in breaking some accessibility barriers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magaga. Dr. Calypso, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share? Um, uh, I, I don't think, that, yeah, there's a, a simple answer to this. And um, what uh, uh, was it, uh, Becky, um, that when she only when she mentioned that she was teaching mathematics, or I, I was uh, my thoughts went on to the teachers who who you know with different uh, subjects and different uh, um, devices and time and support. Uh, I just uh, hope that uh, um, in the schools uh, and uh, the the communities that uh, teachers were uh, able to. Um, provide uh, to, to the students uh, what they they wanted and uh, that to have this kind of uh, tools and uh, access. Um, so this is a diffi difficult, uh, uh, this was a difficult matter. 
Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stay here. I didn't have much to contribute in the end. And, okay, thank you very much, Dr. Calypso. PA, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to confirm that indeed, I think um, it's about giving students purpose. And uh, indeed, uh, Kirsty uh, teaching mathematics, um, for example, I was um, uh, the, the mere fact that you're asking this question, um, I, I know that you're the kind of teacher that is really engaging and looking for, uh, you know, the purpose of, you know, giving purpose to each of the different students that you have, because we are all individuals having our own a set of talents and passions and it's, it's when you put you know talent and passion when you when you put that together with a person with when your students can find their talents and their passions and match them then you know you can you cannot stop them anymore and and i think teaching is about that and the mere fact that you're asking this uh, to me indicates that you're the type of teacher that actually lo is looking for uh, for this for, for a context where to give the students purpose and for example, in our experience with, with uh, what we are doing, is it's, it's about creativity, it's about 21st century skills that we're bringing to students. We're using uh, the idea of inventing a dream machine and then actually learning the students how you can bring such an idea to life. Um, this is a, a learning, it, it's, it's giving purpose to, you know, what's the need of mathematics? We've, we, you know, we've been building a homework making machine, a chase away the bad ghosts from under our bed machine, a, a creating happy homes machine, a, a turning bunk bed because they were fed up with discussing who gets to sleep on top or who gets to sleep below. And so they, the, the children invented a turning bunk bed. You never have to discuss anymore about that. So, but it's, it's when they start working on that, on creating a turning bunk bed, they need mathematics to kind of, to think about, you know, uh, you know, how much engine power do you need to make a, a turning bunk bat uh, and so on and so on. And so it's it's giving the subject uh, a, a type of purpose and ownership with the students that I think allows you as a teacher to actually um, to actually engage more um, uh, um, the, the student, to engage students even more and actually allow them to, to adapt a little bit to their own learning um, um, styles and and for for some uh, uh, for some this will be that mathematics that's their goal that's that's what, what they want to do and they want to learn in theory about mathematics and learn all the details of all theory of mathematics and for others it's about applying the mathematics and knowing what to do what to do with it so i think indeed it's about creativity and giving purpose to students thank you very much pa for that response. We'll open the floor now to our audience members. The first um, audience participant uh, to interact with us is Rati. Uh, Rati, could you please um, open your camera, unmute yourself, and please share your thoughts for one. Hello. Yes, uh, oh. thank you for the opportunity. Yes, I've been listening to uh, the panelists. Thank you so much for your um, inside and thank you for Magdaga and Piet especially about this uh, self-learning and promote independence skill in embrace complexity so it's really fun it, my, my question is education must adapt to this new online learning environment strategically shall we in education have new way in teaching and learning during pandemic the context for this is I'm in a higher education teacher so when now uh, using the same method of teaching like 20, 90 minutes lecture it's boring right so how can like a teacher have this kind of you know creativity as well to make a short video or podcast but at the same time not you know not breaching this regulation of 90 minutes lecture that we need to give based on the curriculum in the university for example that's from my question thank you great thank you rati uh, our next audience participant will be magda Magda with her response. Go ahead and please uh, unmute yourself, turn on your video so we can spotlight you. Magda with the learner being at the center. Hello, uh, my name is Magda Karjalainen. and I am just curious about the response um, to the point about the learner-centered um, approaches, which we are all 
discussing a lot here, but I'm thinking of a teacher in all of this. Are we erasing the teacher completely? And what about the learning of a teacher who is also changed always with every encounter with a student? So I'm just curious, what do you think about that? The learning of teachers through, through and in educational encounters. Thank you. Very thought provoking. Thank you, Magda. Uh, let's bring this back to uh, Maya. Maya, do you have any thoughts on all of these responses? Um, yeah, I agree that uh, even just, just that this uh, question was brought up, it already tells a lot about the person asking it because th that there is this willingness to think about the different students and their the diversity of them and their different um, uh, needs. But uh, yeah, I agree very much with the Magda Karjalainen's point that, uh, and what I was also trying to say that it's, uh, yes, the learner is, um, should be in the focus and it's it's important to empower them it's important to empower them to apply for an education to begin with i know a lot of uh, people who belong in different minorities and they they don't even think or it is said to them or they don't think that higher education even concerns them because there is this uh, sense of disposition disposition in society so uh, yes the learner the empowerment of the learner but then very much what Magda was saying that um, that it's important that we look at the teacher the teacher is a person who has responsibility in in accessibility and inclusivity and creating a, um, an environment that is a human rights <laughs> for students, for example, of different minorities. Um, so when I was talking about mentoring, I, I, I was asked that we need to mentor, offer mentoring and support to the student, but very much to the teacher and very much to the educator on all of this. And they need to also learn, like we know that also white people need to learn about black people <laughs> uh, issue. So it's 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 the same here. Thank you very much, Maya, for adding all of your responses to everyone else. Um, Kirsty, Mick Bean, would you like to add some final thoughts or closing comments to your question? I just want to say thank you very much. You've given me a lot of food for thought there. And and yeah, I think um, I think yeah. Thank you for your wonderful answers. Great, thank you very much, Kirsty. Our uh, last opening panel question. Uh, it looks like we'll be just a few minutes over time uh, into lunch, but I really do believe that this question is necessary to be asked. So this question comes from Laura Del Castillo. Uh, if you could please uh, open your video. Ah, great to have you. Would you like to uh, ask your burning question? Yeah, of course. Hello, and thank you for these amazing discussions. Um, Laura, I'm from Colombia, and I'm doing a master's in development, education, and international cooperation at the University of Ubascula in Finland as well. So the question that I want to ask is, how can one bring more educational access to forgotten areas as well as technology? Thank you. Great comment. Thank you very much for that question. Um, let's have PA. PA, would you mind answering this first? Um, you have a background in STEAM education, and perhaps uh, you can give your thoughts on this. Thank you, Laura, for uh, the question. To me, it was um, it's a difficult. It's it's for, it's it's tackling a very difficult issue. Um, and I'd, uh, I'm afraid I don't have um, a specific answer uh, to your question. Um, it depends a little bit, of course, on the specific context you're, um, you know, each of us uh, um, could think of. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, you, you mentioned forgotten areas. The 
um, the question then is like, okay, what do you mean with forgotten areas? Uh, is it a remote place uh, somewhere in a corner of a big country uh, where there's not a lot of schools or even where the closest university would be like, uh, you, know, you know, far, far away? Um, wh whether it would be um, forgotten areas in terms of maybe, we, we touched upon that as well, that for example, there would be uh, no internet or if there's, if there's internet, it would be extremely expensive because we all know if you want to go to remote areas and you do have internet, then it opens up uh, some of the, uh, you know, some solutions. Uh, if that is not um, possible, then we're really talking about remote areas, uh, which are, let's say, isolated from, um, um, let's call it the education system. So it depends a little bit. There's so much different um, aspects to it and different kind of settings. Um, so I thought your question is a big one and is and is a uh, quite a difficult one. So I would I, I was thinking, it all starts in, in uh, for me it all if you know we're talking about um, uh, accessibility and stuff uh, and everything that goes with it. And for me, it all starts with empathy. It all starts with trying to understand where somebody comes from, the background, and and it doesn't matter what kind of um, accessibility we're talking about. It's about the empathy. And one of one of the elements that I've learned through the years is, is about is this the not making decisions for other people, but actually asking them. And I see organizations um, assuming stuff a lot. Like we assume that uh, people who are in remote areas will be happy if we bring them internet and devices to connect them to internet and then they will be happy with having a educational solution now the question to me is like are you sure about that did you actually ask them those people living in remote areas like what is it that you're actually thinking of if you're thinking about you know getting access to education so I think it's about empathy and, and don't assume your answers, but actually also involve the people that you're, you, you want to work with or bring solutions to involve them and ask them and be creative together in finding solutions. I maybe want to add another thing, which is it's just a um, it's just an idea. Uh, of course, I think if you if you if you think globally, this is about you know something that United Nations should fight for, and they do so. You know, it's United Nations Development Goal Four about uh, uh, education. And I think I was uh, I was thinking about you know you know there's about twenty five thousand universities uh, on the planet, and uh, if you would uh, I was thinking about you know if you look at you know how big our planet is, and I've looked it up quickly, and it's about uh, it's about 129 million square kilometers of uh, habitable area that we have on our on our planet. So if you would divide that by 25,000 universities, it means that you give each university the, the assignment to look for those remote areas and find a solution. And each university should tackle 5,000 square kilometers, which is which is something like three times the city of Johannesburg or two times the city of Moscow. So it's 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 something that you know you can imagine and give each university on this planet the assignment to find one remote area, go there, be creative with the people there and find solutions. It's just an idea that I want to share with, with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, PA, for the um, participatory call to action that we need to take a part of. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Thank you very much. Um, let's open up the floor now to our other panelists. Uh, Magaga, do you have any thoughts you would like to add on? Yeah, sure. Um, when I look at um, um, remote areas, per se, and maybe whether I narrow it down in terms of connectivity and accessibility, that is in terms of internet and maybe good road networks to get access and uh, and then we, uh, like um, Kira is saying, Pete is saying that um, sometimes we tend to assume that maybe because of lack of connectivity, that now leads to barrier to education. But um, sometimes maybe that's not the case. When you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, over is about the figure is that 52 million girls 
cannot access education are out of school. And when you look at the, the reason behind this, you realize that uh, much of it could be due to socioeconomic status, could be poor lack of connectivity, or could be that they are coming from remote areas. But much of it has to do with, I look at culture, the culture and the appreciation for education eh, per se. Because as if we could have, for instance, we could have connectivity, but if the culture is not in them, there's, there's no that appreciation of education per se, then maybe a good connection or rather good internet will not lead to a good turnout of education, as we say. So I think it is an extensive field where we look at all the factor components and it is an issue that cannot be tackled in one line of when you focus on one area but i think it's a, it requires collaborative effect and so many factors involved what are these actual barriers that leads to a uh, poor accessibility of education in these remote areas or regions so i think it has much also to do with culture and uh, the cultural practices in that because i realize where i work the the the, the, the local communities or the, the the i i call this a vulnerable community because i am in them the the middle of a maasai community in kenya these are community that does not appreciate education of girls girls are seen as sources of wealth they are married off by their parents forcefully married arranged marriages and they are also subjected to things like female genital circumcision so you realize this lady okay it, the fact is that they are coming from regions that have got disconnect poor connectivity poor accessibility but look at it deeply it is not because of this collective that there's, there's uh, barriers to education so i think it also has something to do with cultures inside it i thought it was nice to add that up thank you thank you very much magaga dr calypso any thoughts to add on yeah at the beginning uh my first thought was about um access to forgotten areas uh, went on the government on the power positions of people because I, I find that they have the first responsibility not to even have forgotten areas or remote areas and, and not uh, living communities and, and people out of uh, educational access. So uh, my first thought is how to demand from governments, how to speak out, get organized uh, to uh, promote uh, educational access. I know in reality, uh, these communities and areas uh, rely on individuals, on organizations. So at first I thought, yes, find creative solutions so, or solutions like Piet uh, suggested with the universities. Uh, it's the first step, but then considering it as a socio-cultural and socio-economic uh, complex issue, as Magaga said, and uh, lean to collaboration and concentration on, a, on the areas perhaps one by one at a time to have a deeply understanding and a meaningful way uh, of uh, implementing or finding uh, ways to uh, make these areas uh, more uh, accessible in educational accessible in an educational way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Calypso. Uh, Maya Kornen, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I was just also thinking about this forgotten areas and if it can also mean in addition to geographical areas, also kind of mental and um, yeah, mental um, areas that we have forgotten, that we have forgotten the realities of uh, certain people and then we build um, our education systems um, on a norm on, on on a normativity that doesn't include the people and then this um this uh is then uh creating inaccessibility in our education system so uh but i think in art it's a it's a big question right now um whose stories do we see um uh in art and in culture and um yeah all of this has to come to the education and then it becomes part of our uh, reality also and uh, yeah maybe yeah this uh, mental aspect of it also <laughs> thank you very much maya 
We will now open the floor to some of our uh, audience members. I believe we already have some questions. Uh, first up is Bahavna. Would you mind turning on your video so we can spotlight you to respond to the panelists? Uh, Bhavna, well, if she is not there, um, I will ask her question is, I wonder what are the ways in which we can approach intersectionality and inclusive education as educators? Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, Bruno, would you mind sharing your thoughts? Hi, everyone. I was not thinking on getting on the camera, but I can be quick. No, my question was a bit related to thinking and rethinking the the role of teachers and students, right? And how you, even using that word in, as we know, the meaning behind words, right? How we are reproducing a system that is creating that difference already between teacher as someone who knows and student as someone who doesn't know. And even though it's not maybe the responsibility of the student to teach the teacher, but I see so wonderful golden moment when me, uh, me as a teacher, learn something with the students, right? So creating those binaries between the powerful and the non-powerful and the knows, who knows. So that's what I was thinking, that if we keep reproducing those, are we not reproducing this same thing we are talking about? So yeah, just as a thought and thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bruno. Next up we have, I believe, Thea uh, as a response, although you did respond to Mog this question. But if you did want to add anything onto this question, you're welcome to. Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Then I believe we can now move on. Uh, Timothy also added uh, a link. Thank you so much for sharing that and interacting in the chat, everyone. Uh, let's bring it back to PA to. Oh, Arissa, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Arissa, please go ahead, uh, turn on your video, and we will spotlight you. Um, can you see and hear? Yes. Go okay. Um, so uh, adding on to what Bruno said, there are, in some instances, children who can't. Like, that's part of the disability. They can't communicate, like autistic children who have severe communication difficulties. So sometimes, like, we always have to find ways to communicate with people on their own level or, like, come into their world. Um, and that's just my, my take on it, is that sometimes we have to have the knowledge, like to communicate with autistic children, you have to have the knowledge of how or what you should do to reach them. Thank you very much, Irissa, for that very good point. I'd like to bring it back now to PA to give some final remarks to everything that's been said. PA, for two minutes. Yeah, thank you everybody for, um, you know, the great add-ons and, um, um, you know, Magaga talking about, uh, of course, the culture, which is so important. You can, you can bring any solution as long as, you know, you need to incorporate the culture. Uh, Calypso talking about bringing, you know, embracing joy in education, uh, the responsibility of, um, of the government um in all of this and maya about of course mental forgotten areas i uh, all of this is is uh, part of of um the, you know the, the different solutions that we're we're looking for and i I'm, i maybe wanted to um share this final idea and which was um you know there's a there's an uh, there's a saying in english that that uh, done is better than perfect so i would i would recommend anybody who has an idea uh, of of creating a you know a part of a solution for whether it would be mental forgotten areas whether whether it would be for what governments could do whether what it would be what you could do to you know to make make the culture around education better if you have any idea just go ahead uh, make it make it happen um, go out there explore um, and see whether or not it works. Um, and and then and then grow grow with your idea idea from that because I think again done is better than perfect so just if you have ideas just go go and make it work thank you
Thank you very much, panelists, for sharing your thought, Pierre, as well. Uh, I would like to open up the floor one last time to Laura to share any closing remarks, if you would like to. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the interesting discussions. And every panelist gave a lot of important points. And I guess we need, as Pierre and all everyone said, we need to ask the people who we are helping and understand the needs of everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. And again, uh, on behalf of Burning Questions 2021 and all of our audience members and organizing team, I just want to give a warm thank you to Dr. Calypso, PA, Maya, and Magaga for joining us on the opening panel. You provided not just thought-provoking uh, questions and responses and approaches to answers, um, but really brought up some really good approaches to all of these topics. So with that, I do want to note that this opening panel will be available after the conference. Uh, as you can see in the top left corner of your screen, this is being recorded. As of currently, the chat will be saved and only available to those who have registered to Burning Questions 2021. Um, and I see so many good questions. I haven't been able to read many of these, um, but we have a great team who's reading all of the, the chat right now. But if you do want to interact with any of our opening panelists or later tomorrow, our closing panelists, you can go ahead and contact us at burningq.com forward slash feed uh, form forward slash feedback 21. Uh, or you can email us at burningqolu at gmail.com and we can get you their contact information. Uh, again, just want to say thank you so much panelists and it, we'll see you hopefully in some of the networking group discussion or individual discussion rooms. Thank you everyone. Mel, back to you. Thank you so much, Matthew, and our lovely panelists for the excellent opening panel discussion. I was sitting right over there and listening to some really great points, very thought-provoking points I will think of later when I'm going to bed. So uh, for the rest of the event, it looks like we'll be going into lunch now. Um, just a reminder that the breakout rooms, just like in the virtual coffee se section, will be open for people to hang out and continue the conversations. and after lunch, we'll be going into the workshop introductions, and then at 1.30 p.m., we will be starting the workshops. Thank you so much, and I will see you after lunch. <laughs>